Michael Stoll graduated from UC Berkeley with a bachelor's degree in political economy. He went on to complete his PhD in urban planning at MIT in 1995. He served as visiting scholar at the Russell Sage Foundation in New York City in 1999 and 2000, and today chairs the public policy program in UCLA's Luskin School of Public Affairs. In this 2006 article, Stoll tackles the issue of mismatch between where people live and where jobs are located in today's deconcentrating urban areas. He offers an interesting alternative way to use the index of dissimilarity. Instead of comparing the locations of two different groups of people to each other, he compares the distribution of people to the distribution of jobs. This work is important because he links the amount of mismatch between people and jobs to the extent of sprawl or deconcentration of cities. On the concerns expressed by Jack Casarda 17 years earlier, Stoll brings us into the 21st century only to find that the mismatch problem still plagues many U.S. cities. Urban deconcentration and segregation by both class and ethnicity have continued, and the resulting loss of economic foundations for the lives of many central city residents has even intensified in many places. Stoll also continues Casarda's focus on the distribution of workplaces throughout a metropolitan region, talking about what he calls job sprawl. In order to understand his research approach as well as his conclusions, we must first be clear about just what he means by this phrase. His approach is extremely simple, perhaps even too simplified in some respects. He proposes drawing a couple of rings over the map of a city, reminiscent of the rings that defined Ernest Burgess's concentric urban zones. One ring is a circle with a radius of five miles, starting from the center of the city. Of course, this assumes that the city does have a clearly identifiable single central hub. There's no problem to identify such a starting point in many cities, such as Charlotte, North Carolina, as shown here. But we have seen that for other urban areas like Los Angeles, it might be quite challenging to apply this method. The other mile ring thus has an area of a little over 75 square miles while the bigger 10-mile ring has a much larger area covering almost 315 square miles, more than four times the area of the smaller circle. Stoll's intention with these two circles is to provide templates for both smaller metropolitan areas, the smaller circle, and huge metro areas like New York, Dallas, Atlanta, or Chicago, the larger circle. These abstract circles, while it reminds us of the classic Chicago school approach to urban ecology, is rather arbitrary, and you might be able to come up with a better, less one-size-fits-all approach yourself someday. He defines one of these circles, usually the smaller one with a five-mile radius. He counts the number of jobs inside the circle and the number of jobs outside the circle. The proportion of all jobs located outside the circle is his measure of job sprawl. The first stage of his analysis connects differences in such job sprawl proportions to differences in how severe the jobs versus residences mismatch problem is in these same cities. In other words, he starts with a distribution of jobs and then compares it to the distribution of people's homes. How could job sprawl be increasing the mismatch between jobs and residences? The length of the urban dumbbell separating people's homes from their workplaces could increase as a result of deconcentration of employment if the jobs were moving outward but the people were being left behind. Those who managed to hold on to jobs as they relocated have to move outward, or if that were not possible, they would have to commute longer distances. Those who could not follow the jobs outward would be out of luck, stuck in the challenging dead-end central city environments already described by Casarda. On the other hand, how could job sprawl be shrinking the mismatch between jobs and residences? If people are already moving out to the suburbs, as already shown in the number of readings, then deconcentration of employment out into the suburbs would bring the jobs to them and reduce the mismatch between homes and workplaces. Working in one of the new edge cities and living in a nearby suburban neighborhood could dramatically cut down on long distance commuting. So the possible connection between job sprawl and the mismatch between homes and workplaces is not a foregone conclusion for Stoll when he starts this research. The net effect of job sprawl could go either way. 
It is his job to gather the empirical evidence and decide which effect predominates in contemporary U.S. cities. To measure job sprawl, he has to find out where jobs actually are in each city. This kind of information is not available in most sample surveys and not even in the census of population and housing, which is all about the residential side of the mismatch problem. But fortunately for Stoll, the Census Bureau also publishes a regular series of reports called Business Patterns, providing statistics on employers broken down by postal zip code tabulation areas for every U.S. metropolitan area. These statistics include the number of employees at each facility, the type of work being done there, information about revenues and expenditures, and many other very useful pieces of information that help both private firms and government agencies plan effectively for their futures. Zip code tabulation areas are small enough that Stoll can allocate nearly all of them to either the inside or the outside of his five-mile circle on a map. To measure the other end of the urban dumbbell, the residential pattern of people, he relies on population statistics from the 2000 census for these same metropolitan areas. You will follow exactly the same strategy when you study population characteristics of zip code tabulation areas for your team's city project assignment in this course. These areas are very useful for such comparative analysis because the Postal Service created these areas based on a uniform measurement approach all over the country. In contrast, local political boundaries drawn inside cities follow very different patterns for different cities, sometimes creating one huge central area and a lot of little separate entities around the edges, sometimes creating areas that look more like Homer Hoyt's pie slices, and many other strange alternatives. Stoll considers this distribution of population in different zip code areas separately for the black population, the white population, and the Latino population of each metro area. Instead of comparing the residential locations of these groups to each other, as we've seen other scholars do using the index of dissimilarity, he compares the residential locations of each population group to the locations of the job base of the city. For each zip code tabulation area, he subtracts the percent of city jobs in that area from the percent of the black or other population in that area, takes the absolute value, and adds up the results for all the areas. One half of that total is the index of dissimilarity. A higher index means that more people live in different areas from where jobs are located. A lower index means more people live in the same areas where jobs are found. Interesting, of course, this is not a perfect research design. Trying to measure the situations of real people living in the complicated tangle of the real world always forces social scientists to make measurement compromises. For example, if we know that people do not have enough jobs inside their zip code area, that does not tell us how far away they actually are from jobs outside that area. There might be a lot of jobs in the very next adjacent zip code, or they might live in the middle of a job desert that covers many zip code areas. Similarly, this approach does not sort out different kinds of jobs at all, such as Casarda did with blue-collar, clerical, professional, and other occupational categories. It also does not sort out people with different levels of education, or other measures of job qualifications such as work experience. So there's room here, as always, for another refinement and improvement of the research model by future scholars, including possibly you. But Stoll's approach is not a bad start. At least we will get some idea of how the distribution of jobs in each city compares to the distribution of each ethnic population. We will be able to see whether spread out cities with high job sprawl scores also have higher mismatch problems due to jobs leaving people behind, or whether high job sprawl scores are linked to smaller mismatch problems due to jobs following people out to their new suburban residences metropolitan areas in the United States, Stoll calculated values of his selected measures of job sprawl and mismatch for each city. As shown in the first row of his Table 1, almost two-thirds of the average city's total job base was found outside a five-mile circle centered on the Central Business District. This one statistic by itself shows how far the deconcentration process had come by the beginning of the new century. In the same row, we can see that about one-third of all white residents of the average city would have to move to a different zip code area in order to have people and jobs distributed in the same proportions across the city. 
For Latinos, 44% would have to move, and for black residents, almost 54% would have to move. Or to put it another way, these are the percentages of jobs that would have to be shifted to different zip code areas in order to put them where the people of each ethnic group live. If these index of dissimilarity values could be reduced to zero, it would mean that there would be enough jobs within each zip code area for all the people to go to work without leaving that area. As we've already noted, though, this does not include any consideration of whether they're the right kinds of jobs and people for each other. Looking down the column of job sprawl values for different subgroups of cities, we see that naturally the largest cities with over half a million people had more jobs outside a five-mile circle. Sprawl was lowest in the older, more concentrated cities of the Northeast, and highest for the cities in the West, where population densities in general are lowest. More interestingly, at the bottom of this column, we see that jobs are much more sprawled outside the five-mile circle for cities where more than 10% of the population was black, compared to the much lower level of job sprawl for cities where less than 5% of the population was black. Stoll points out in the article that this is tricky to decide which of these facts is cause and effect, so he has to engage in some complicated statistical tricks in order to deal with the possible two-ray relation between them. No matter how we divide up the cities, every category of city always shows the lowest levels of mismatch between homes and workplaces for the white population. There's not even very much variation in mismatch for whites across different types of cities. This certainly reflects the fact that the movement of people to the suburbs has involved predominantly whites in most cities, so that when jobs also move outward to suburbs, it may even actually decrease mismatch problems for the white population. In contrast, the high level of mismatch experienced by black populations also shows more variability from one type of city to another. The lowest mismatch problem for black residents appears in southern cities. The highest level of mismatch is found in the Northeast, where black populations were concentrated in central cities as a result of the Great Migration. The difference between these high and low scores for southern compared to northeastern cities is almost 20 percentage points, compared, compared to the maximum difference between regions for whites of only 4 percentage points in the D-index scores. As we might expect, since cities with larger black populations have more job sprawl, those same cities also have higher D-index scores for the mismatch between jobs and the homes where these larger black populations live. Mismatch results for the Latino population fall somewhere in between the results for blacks and whites, also as expected. They again experience the lowest mismatch problems in the South and the greatest problems in the Northeast. And cities with larger black populations not only have higher mismatch scores for blacks, but also for Hispanics, and to some extent even for whites, perhaps as a result of more sprawl. To evaluate this possibility that sprawl, in fact, is making the mismatch problem worse, Stoll enters all his figures for the different cities into a statistical model that also includes some additional possible causes of mismatch. He finds that higher D-index values indicating mismatch for jobs compared to black populations are significantly correlated with higher job sprawl scores for cities. This connection between sprawl and mismatch was not statistically significant, though, for Hispanics or for whites. After considering several other possible complicating factors, such as the overall mix of professional, service, and blue-collar jobs in each city, Stoll still finds the same conclusion that, quote, an increase in the sprawl index by 10 percentage points is associated with a 3.1 percentage point increase in mismatch conditions for blacks, unquote. So the first step of his investigation seems to establish that at least part of the mismatch problem can be traced back to the deconcentration of cities, and in particular the combination of residential segregation in the suburbs with the subsequent shift of jobs outward from central cities into those segregated suburbs. Having established this link, though, Stoll is only halfway to his overall conclusion. After all, job sprawl and the resulting mismatch between homes and workplaces may be inconvenient for many people, and disproportionately inconvenient for black residents of these cities, 
but in the end the real question is whether these patterns also translate into actual employment problems for the affected population. In order to look for possible connections between the level of mismatch for jobs versus residents on the one hand and some kind of resulting impact on employment rates, Stoll must come up with a measure for each of his studied cities that reflects the employment situation, just as he did for job sprawl and the mismatch problem. Since he is not looking at specific occupational groups, he can select some kind of global measure of employment. The measure he chooses, the jobs to population ratio, is about as global and uncomplicated as he can get. He simply counts up the number of jobs held by members of each ethnic population, as listed for each metropolitan area in the business patterns reports, and divides that total by the population of the city for that ethnic group. Actually, he does not include the total population since not everyone is expected to be working. For example, little children aren't supposed to be in the labor force, and neither are old people, so he restricts the denominator of this ratio to people between the ages of 21 and 65. He also leaves out any people who were enrolled in formal education and people with disabilities that prevented them from working. The closer the resulting ratio gets to 1, the fewer people there are in the working ages who don't have jobs. It might have been nice to have this jobs to population ratio separately for the areas inside and outside of his five mile circle, but since he computes it separately for each of the three ethnic populations he considers, we can still get a good idea about the employment picture in each city as a whole. Just as he tried predicting the mismatch problem as statistically linked to job sprawl, and found a significant positive relationship, he extends the chain of his logic and tries predicting his employment measure as statistically linked in its turn to mismatch scores. For the black populations of his considered cities, Stoll's Table 6 shows a lot of stars for statistical significance along most of the first row of model coefficients. These starred scores are all negative, meaning that more mismatch predicts less employment. In his first column, we see that this pattern holds for the entire black labor force of these cities. The cities with higher mismatch scores have lower rates of employment overall. In the second and third column of figures, when he splits the population between men and women, both coefficients remain negative, but only the effect of mismatch on employment rates for black men remains large and statistically significant. For black women, overall mismatch in the city does not have a significant negative effect on their chances of being employed. Finally, he looks at whether this pattern is any different when we consider different subgroups of the black population on the basis of education. For high school dropouts, and also for black high school graduates, living in cities with higher mismatch index scores is an important predictor of not being able to find a job. But for the black population that has attended college at all, this negative effect is no longer significant, and for people who graduated from college, the effect of sprawl is not even negative at all. This probably means that college-educated members of the black population are more able to qualify for the new, higher-skilled jobs that are being created in central cities, and also that some of them have managed to move outward to the suburbs, even as many jobs were moving in the same direction. But apart from these exceptions for women and for college graduates, Stahl's results lead him to a second clear conclusion. Quote, a 10 percentage point increase in mismatch conditions faced by blacks is associated with a 1.4 percentage point reduction in their employment to population ratio. But when he started this study, Stoll was concerned, first of all, with the job sprawl problem, the deconcentration of the city, not only residentially, but occupationally. So he's very interested to know whether job sprawl itself might also be affecting employment rates, in addition to the direct effects linked to the mismatch problem. He decides to see whether both these patterns might be separate, independent effects on employment, by putting them both into the same model as predictors of the jobs to population ratio in different cities. The results of this combination is shown in the bottom half of his table 6. He singles out the three most serious problems identified in the top half of the table, that is, the effects for men, for high school dropouts, and for people with terminal high school diplomas and no college. 
For each group, the bottom panel of the table shows two models, one with just the job sprawl measure and one with both job sprawl and the mismatch shown by the index of dissimilarity. The models with job sprawl alone, columns 1, 3, 5, and 7, all have at least one star for statistical significance of the coefficient, and all coefficients are negative as expected. More job sprawl goes hand in hand with lower employment for black men, dropouts, and high school graduates. But the models with both measures, columns 2, 4, 6, and 8, tell a different story. Values of the index of dissimilarity between jobs and black residential locations again show a very powerful, statistically significant, negative relation to employment rates. But no important effect of job sprawl itself remains in this model, apart from its link to the mismatch problem. How should we understand these results? As Stahl himself says, quote, when mismatch is entered into the equations for all blacks and for each subgroup just discussed, the effect of job sprawl disappears, unquote. But we already know that the mismatch problem is itself positively linked to urban deconcentration and job sprawl. So we're left with two demonstrated links in this logical chain. First of all, the sorting out of contemporary cities, shifting both residents and jobs outward, and segregating residents by ethnicity and social class, contributes to the problem of mismatch between where people live and where they work, especially for the black populations who remain concentrated in the abandoned central cities. And second, the cities that have gone furthest down this path and that have generated the highest levels of such mismatch between homes and jobs have the lowest levels of employment for people in the black labor force in these cities. As Stoll and other scholars continue to refine their measures and our understanding of this complex and changing situation, one thing remains clear and shows no sign of going away. When cities spread themselves outward over the countryside, segregating different social groups in separate residential areas and drawing more jobs outward with them, there are winners and losers in the urban setting. Since all of these changes are the result of choices and actions being made by the residents of these cities, they are all part of a political as well as an economic process, and are even subject to deliberate attempts to shape the city through public and private policy decisions. 